I shouldn't have to tell you this, but, uh, spoilers. Spoilers for everything. I'll be blunt. Reviews aren't my thing. You've seen my video on the menu. You know how I feel about creators whose entire brand is just criticizing someone else's work. But y'all know I'm a slut for critical thinking, overanalyzing, and trying to find meaning in what could otherwise be meaningless. Despite the way our flag means death tries to appear meaningless, it actually plays out more like a classical novel. One of the best things about those novels is that they leave a lot of room for interpretation. Everything can mean something, from the color of the sky to the color of the outfits. But hey, at least there's no blue windows. So we're going to break this up into two parts. The first will be a quick history lesson, then we'll sort of go into the review and critical breakdown. Our Flag Means Death is a 10 episode series based on the story of Steed Bonnet, a former landowner, slave owner, who left his family to become what we know today as the Gentleman Pirate. His decision to become a pirate was just as unceremonious as it was in the show. He bought a vessel and crew in secret and bounced, leaving his wife and three surviving children behind. Although one might say what really spurred him into leaving was being unable to deal with the death of his oldest son, but whatever. No one asked me. Now, there's actually no record of whether or not the real Steve Bonnet ever saw active duty in the Barbados militia. Now, shortly after, about three months into his tenure, he did run afoul of the Spanish Navy and got stranded in the Bahamas with a badly damaged ship and badly damaged body. Much like in the show, that's how he ended up collaborating with Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard. Not much is known about Teach outside of his career as a pirate, other than the possibility of him being mixed race and maybe the son of a former slave. What we do know is that he actually wasn't as successful as one might think. He was more of a strategist who preferred fear tactics and mind games over overt violence. Judging by a brief perusal of his life on Wikipedia, he had trouble staying entertained for lack of a better word. He was a cult of personality, but really struggled to maintain those relationships, especially considering how many times he'd been betrayed. However, thanks to Charles Johnson's A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates, he was easily the most fascinating out of all the stories available. Hence, he became the most famous. The show actually references general histories a lot throughout the show, including showing its various illustrations of Blackbeard. After meeting in Nassau, Bonnet and Teach worked closely, often assuming command of the other ships when the other was indisposed. It's long been speculated that Bonnet became a close confidant of Teach's, and the former convinced him to accept the king's pardon for known pirates. This pardon was essentially a desperate bid from the British Empire to prevent pirates from stealing or otherwise freeing their slaves. Either way, Teach watched Bonnet receive the pardon and immediately abandon him. Similar to the show, he stripped Bonnet's ship and marooned his crew. According to histories, Bonnet found his crew shortly after, but never found Blackbeard. Moreover, his relentless pursuit of the man eventually got him trapped at Cape Fear, where he was captured and executed. Ironically, Teach retired not too far from him, in the Carolinas. But seeing as how he'd made a lot of enemies, this lasted about all of three months. And he was back out at sea again, where he was eventually hunted down, and after a long, arduous battle, bore mirrored by Robert Maynard and his crew. Our flag means death took this story and based it on naval scholars' speculation about their possible romantic relationship. Because no matter how you slice it, both men were each other's only confidant in their lives. They worked more closely together than Calico Jack and Bonnie and Mary Reed. And Mary Reed had Jack's baby. You don't get much closer than that. They also shed some light on how their relationship deeply affected their crew. After Bonnet and Teach's final falling out, they were subject to their whims and often put in harm's way thanks to their hasty decisions. It's a slightly absurdist take on just how complicated leaving your life behind can be. There's no such thing as a clean break. Something always gets left behind, and you can't always fix it. Love is messy. 
and requires hard work to maintain. You might be empty, but in the hands of the right person, you might have more to give than you ever thought possible. At its core, Our Flag Means Death is the story of Steed Bonnet and Edward Teach, who are so deeply alienated by the people around them and their lives that they find solace in each other. Unfortunately, they find that that isn't enough and fall back into their old lives. One finds the power to move on when he receives forgiveness and understanding that he's been yearning for his entire life, while the other finds empathy but has no practical use for it, and therefore he only becomes further isolated. This story is a lot more mature and honestly more masculine than I think anyone gives it credit for, and I don't say that as a bad thing. My favorite thing about this show is the staging and the use of colors, and not to mention the absolute fire literary themes. Everything feels super close and intimate on the ship, even when you don't want it to be. The Queen Anne's revenge feels small and huge at the same time, and fits all the crew's needs to the point where you don't wonder how they're dealing with their faculties off screen. And it's clear that some crew need more than others. Any negative space is used beautifully, and the color of the characters' clothes play into their stories. Everything is color corrected, of course, but it's done so in a way that isn't distracting. However, it's not enough to distract me from the narrative faults of the show. Whether it's the length or the episodes or the three-act structure, its pacing is absolutely buckwild for no reason full of starts and stops and bits that seem great until you think about them for a minute. The show wants to be a dark, absurdist comedy and succeeds in several aspects, but only with easy targets. It's almost like the show is afraid to lean too hard into dark comedy, then it will ruin the more heartfelt moments of the show, which is an incredible challenge, don't get me wrong, but I think we have seen enough shows on this channel like Vox Machina and Spy Family that have managed to pull it off. This could improve in the coming seasons, but I'd rather not place my bets on what might happen in the future, unhatched eggs and all that. One of the reasons I think this show struggles with the pacing is Steed. And yes, all throughout my reaction series, I have been deeply critical of Steed and everything he does. But my problem with Steed is he's bumbling to the point where he comes across as almost irredeemably selfish. They fail to make his mistakes endearing especially toward the final episode. I'm fine with deeply insecure characters. It's often very rewarding to watch them develop and take responsibility for their actions. I understand why Steed left Edward at the dock. I understand why he decided to go back to his old life and hit the reset button, because he's always been able to. Nothing in his life has ever permanently changed in a way that could danger his existence social status, or the people around him. However, the show can't lament the fact that no one has ever thought much of him when he goes around doing the same thing to everyone else. Like, I know the 40 orange glaze cake was supposed to be funny, but it just made Steed look like a selfish asshole. While I do think his progression from coward to caption is exceptional, his character faults aren't addressed in a way that leaves me feeling like he's a changed man, or that I can overlook his faults and focus on the problem at hand. In a way, it's giving Bojack Horseman. When Steed does wrong, the story acts like it's enough that he feels really bad about it. And that's it. He receives a lot more grace than everyone else. He keeps getting saved by coincidences that no one else in this story is entitled to. Kind of like Jace from Arcane, who I'm also not a big fan of. This ever-present get-out-of-jail-free card seriously jeopardizes the story because it leads to a lot of very funny Looney Tunes logic bits. However, when they meet harsh reality, Steed still emerges remarkably unscathed. Now, I get it. It's a comedy. I understand that permanent consequences does kind of kill the vibe, which is why a lot of people have rejected the fact that Lucius, my favorite character, is dead. I am actually 
on the side of Lucius actually being dead, or that he's not going to come back until late in the second season if he does. But I think he's going to come back as a hallucination, much like the Navy captain who got dead in the beginning of the show. Except this time, it'll be for Edward. Lucius embodies the theme of this show, which to me is compassion. Such a small amount of consideration goes a long way with these characters, who for all intents and purposes, have had really rough lives. Throughout the show, Lucius remains the perfect caretaker. The mom friend, if you will. All the while maintaining his own boundaries and prioritizing his own survival, Lucius knows people. And everything he does is deliberate, even when he's misjudged people like with Calico Jack. However, the minute he empathizes with someone enough to let his guard down, he's instantly punished for it. And honestly, I don't think it's one big fake out. If this is going to end happily, as the showrunners claim, one of the things that has to happen is Edward internalizing everything he learned about being a softer, kinder person. The writers might use Lucius's ghost as a way to depict that process, because I highly doubt that if Lucius does live, that he'll want anything to do with him. One of the reasons I think he'll stay dead is that death isn't cheap in this universe. In fact, it's one of the biggest themes of the show. Episode 6 is like my favorite episode, despite its chaotic nature, because it shows that life might be cheap in the pirate world, but death isn't, specifically killing. Death is permanent, and it changes people. It's revealed Blackbeard, one of the most notorious pirates on the Spanish main, has only killed one person, his own father, while people on the outside talk about killing like it's a cool, manly thing to do. Steed and Blackbeard are shown to have suffered great mental distress because of it. This idea is stated over and over again through Steed's hallucinations, the symbolism of the Kraken, which is a creature that only exists to consume and take life, and Jim's entire backstory. Steed straight up says this in the last episode, which I've made pretty clear at this point is my least favorite, for reasons I'll expound upon toward the end of the video. Speaking of Jim, they're the perfect person to start going beyond the general plot. While it's fun to refer to them as a cool non-binary ninja, as we get to know them, their fixation with knives and murderous intent becomes more endearing than daunting. It's important to remember that except for maybe Izzy, Jim is the only killer in the main crew, and they remain deeply alienated from everyone, even Olawande, despite his numerous attempts at getting through to them. My guess is Blackbeard wants to keep Jim around because they've killed, and he wants to know how he can follow suit without the trauma. Well, joke's on Blackbeard, because Jim has all the trauma. I mean, the show even goes so far as to have them mimic a stained glass Catholic portrait, which says a lot. This show put a lot into Jim's character arc, only to fumble at the last minute when suddenly things are just okay with them. After one conversation with Spanish Jackie. And apparently the sex was so mind-blowing, Oluwande couldn't think logically anymore because he suddenly stopped being the smartest person on the crew. Like, bro! You were holding the brain cell. Where did you put it? It seems like Izzy has it, but no, he doesn't. He wants it though, really badly. Someone said in my comments that Izzy is a human on a ship full of Muppets. And I think that description is good. Doesn't fit in perfectly. Izzy is Edward's shadow, depicted in the fact that he's the one in black. And when he speaks, Edward is the one usually in the foreground. He's the representation of Edward's past, creeping up on him in his darkest moments, seizing on him whenever he's conflicted or unsure. You know, when in doubt, stick to what you know and everything. But Izzy has far more agency than just the shadow. I'm getting a lot of conflicting opinions on this, but where I stand is that Izzy is the world, infatuated with the idea of the hard, ruthless Blackbeard who can command a ship with an iron fist. He spends the entire series wanting Blackbeard, not Edward, even going so far to refer to Edward as this 
thing you've become, as opposed to the whole self-actualized person he's desperately trying to be. I mean, he can barely stand to call or hear anyone call him anything other than Blackbeard. He even struggles to do it when he's marooning everyone on the island. The world doesn't want Edward to be Edward. They want him to be the fearsome Blackbeard, the ideal adventurer and captain. They don't care that he's hurting, or that he's lonely, or that he's scared. If Izzy does care about any of that, and he could, he certainly thinks that being Blackbeard again is what's going to make Edward better, despite the fact that that's what's killing him in the first place. Izzy is an antagonist, and in the first season, the antagonist wins. With a price, of course. I honestly don't believe that Izzy was scared or nervous by the end. Despite the apparent mutilation, this is what he's been hoping for. He won. He got his black beard back. Now, do I think he'll end up regretting it? Absolutely. But it's important to remember, historically, Izzy was the one who won in the end. However, according to histories, he did get what was essentially poor person's disease and immediately died afterwards. Like I said in the Word of Honor reaction series, antagonist and protagonist don't really mean much in the case of morality in stories like these. Edward is not a good person. He knows he's not a good person. He doesn't really want to be either. When it comes down to it, what he wants is to rest. But I think referring to either him or Steed as the good guys and Izzy as the bad guy does the story a huge disservice. At the end of the day, the story comes down to what is keeping Edward from getting what he wants. Edward wants to make the pain go away. Being Blackbeard is killing him. He wants to find a way to stop. But at the same time, it's all he knows. He went into his and Steed's relationship wanting to be fixed. Izzy wants to fix Edward, but the only way he can do that is if things go back to the way they were. Because in his eyes, everything was fine until recently. Steed realizes Edward has literally never been okay. He knows he can't fix him. So, he provides space for him to feel heard and safe, so he can express his emotions without feeling like he's dying. What they do in the interim doesn't really matter. That's low-key my biggest issue with the show, but in the grand scheme of things, what I think doesn't really matter. The show has been extremely faithful and giving to its fanbase. Unlike some of the shows HBO Max has to offer, it genuinely seems to respect its audience, being careful not to lean into some of the infamous themes that have alienated fans in the past. That might be because of its diverse cast. It's pretty easy to tell that they went the extra mile in casting characters of diverse races, gender identities, and ethnicities. However, these characters' storylines are the ones that suffer the most. There's clearly a lot left on the cutting room floor, and their stories were clearly sacrificed in order to wrap up the main plot. Overall, Our Flag Means Death made a valiant effort, and I think it should be appreciated despite its faults. There is a part of me that believes we could get a better version of this story with other, lesser-known pirates, but I mean, hindsight is 2020 and everything. It's easy to say what something should have been when you're talking in the third person. But when it comes down to it, this show is too short. This story has no room to breathe for everything it wants to do. And the insistence that we should wait for a second season so it can do all those things isn't enough for me. The simple fact is, show seasons are too short these days, and I get it, the rules of engagement have changed. Streaming services can't air episodes like TV channels did. To be honest, I don't think we'll ever find the happy medium between too much filler and not enough story, because it's so nebulous depending on what kind of story you're telling. And no matter what story is being told, there will always be something left on the cutting room floor. But when these 30-minute series are so short, their endings are always abrupt and disappointing. 
While I say the end of our flag means death, did the best they could do with what time they had, that doesn't mean it was adequate. I feel like I've been pushed off a cliff. The character regression is so abrupt that I felt more disappointed than properly horrified. It's like the show forgot that Edward was the one who went out on a limb for Steed in the first place, and that out of all the times Izzy's conniptions had no effect on him, one, at a moment where he actually wasn't particularly vulnerable, suddenly worked, and in record time. Not to mention everything Jim had gone through in episode 7 just suddenly resolved, with very little preamble. And this. Calling it now, he's coming back as a ghost haunting Ed and he will actually be dead. Our Flag Means Death is a good show, but when it comes right down to it, it disappointed me. If I were to grade it from 10, meaning flawless masterpiece, to 1, meaning absolute garbage fire, and 5, being unremarkably average, I'd give it a good, but if I was alone, I probably wouldn't have finished it. And before you crucify me in the comments, pretty much nothing is a 10 in my eyes, and the 9s are few and far in between. I will pick up the second season as long as I get a second HBO Max free trial, because I'm still mad what they did about Infinity Train. But regardless, please like if you like this video, please subscribe if you really like this video and would like to see more. If you would like to support the channel, you can find me on Patreon, where I post full uncut reactions the day before I post them on YouTube. So right now we're kind of working with a Wednesday to Friday situation, so when I post on Wednesday, you'll see it on Tuesday. When I post it on Friday, you'll see it on Thursday. You can find me on every piece of social media, Tumblr, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, but mostly Tumblr and TikTok. TikTok's on thin ice, and fuck Twitter. With that being said, if you like, please leave a comment on what you would like me to call these videos. Should I call them like critical reviews or critical analysis? I feel like they're kind of both, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Either way, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay weird, lovely, and happy eating.